Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries. I'm your host, John, and today we're going to be looking at No Rest for the Wicked, a module for the old school game Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Okay, so as ever with these episodes where we look through adventure modules, it's kind of hard to discuss without giving away the plot, or at least some of the plot, of the adventure. So before you go any further, consider this your spoiler warning. If you don't want any spoilers, might be better to go ahead and play this adventure or run it, then come back to this review. Well, so with that out of the way, let's crack on and have a look at No Rest for the Wicked. So No Rest for the Wicked is what I like to refer to as a brief bridge or a drop-in module and that's no shade on this particular module written by J. Stuart Pate. It's a very interesting and well put together module. Now I simply mean that it's a, a sort of short bridging module that you could drop into a campaign in the middle of other stuff going on and it would serve as a nice a little sort of self-contained scenario that you could fit between other major events going on in your game. So if we look on the back of this book, we can see that it, in the little blurb that it's set in 1632 and during the wars of religion that are engulfing this fictional weird fantasy version of Europe, which is the assumed setting for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Although, as the author points out later on in the book, it's pretty easy to adapt this to any other setting, you know, tweaking the sort of ethnicities of certain characters, NPCs in it, and changing a few names to fit more with your own campaign world. Not really difficult at all. Although I think newer GMs might have sort of benefited from a little bit more guidance, but this is just a short little adventure. It's not really designed as like a big campaign book. And there's a plethora of other advice on that sort of stuff out there on the internet and in other books if you really need it for the newer GM. We start off with a little blurb titled War is Hell and Hell is other people where the author talks about the benefits of in a fantasy game or a weird fantasy game in the case of lamentations of the flame princess the benefits of ensuring that not everything is wacky and weird because if you do so then the weird just becomes another word for commonplace if everything's weird to paraphrase a popular quote then nothing is so in this blurb the author talks about the benefits of occasionally dropping in scenarios that deal with purely sort of mundane, i.e. not fantastic elements. And that's what this book seeks to do. We move on to a short setup that gives us a capsule sort of rundown of what's going to happen in the adventure module. With the characters arriving at an inn between two other points of interest, once they arrive there's a timeline of events that unfold assuming the characters do nothing obviously if the characters interact with it or change things then the timeline itself will change and there's advice offered throughout the book essentially the timeline is that there are some refugees from this religious war hiding out in the tavern being helped by the sympathetic tavern owner who's got like a small family farm and whole and homestead on the side of the tavern that he built up however this refugee in particular is a deserter from one of the armed forces with his family he's had enough of war he burnt down a village to cover his escape and now he's desperately being sought by the forces that he used to serve some people arrive at the village claiming to be just travelers and in fact they're spies for the imperial army who've had a tip off that these refugees are moving through the area the soldiers will eventually turn up to reinforce them they search the area they'll find where these people are hiding underneath in the cellar of the cottage of the tavern owner there will be a firefight and pretty much everyone will get killed well that's what will happen if the player characters don't do anything but they can change it obviously if they get involved with it we're given a background on Griswold Herzog, the man who owns the farm and built the tavern on that land. He once fought for the Catholic League and returned a battle-scarred veteran, seeing through 
enough atrocities to become disillusioned with the righteousness of his cause. He returned home and set about building his family home in the foothills of the Ore Mountains. He tried to stay remote enough so that the war didn't impinge on the life of himself and his family. However, being a man of conscience, he allowed the Protestant Union people to use his inn as a dead drop location and as a meeting house. Now this is remote enough that it wouldn't normally have caused him a problem but as I say these particular refugees have turned up the Steiner family there. The Steiners are fleeing Catholic League persecution. Under normal circumstances they could have probably slipped away but Ludwig Steiner is officially recognised as a deserter from the Imperial Army and he burnt down the village of Wensditch Rindorf to cover his escape so agents of the Imperial Army are after him. We get a timeline of events that will occur, sort of broken down in more detail and now explaining what will happen as time progresses. And this just expands on the sort of like little capsule timeline that you get at the start. And then we move on to an aftermath, which just gives you a few ideas of what might happen after this timeline has occurred. So we're told that if the characters do nothing, you know, they just want a good night's sleep, whatever, that's a perfectly valid choice, then Eventually, the Steiners will be located by the agents of the Imperial Army, and both they and the Herzogs, as accessories, will be dealt with. The soldiers will then move along the next day while trying to determine what to do with the place, but they'll probably just strip it for supplies and anything of value. What they do with the player characters depends on whether they believe the player characters are simply ignorant of the these rebels hiding out there, or whether they are in fact helping to support them. We're told if the characters cast spells, this will escalate the situation depending on the sort of spells being cast. Obviously, the clergy look very dimly on that. If the soldiers witness or hear of obvious magic user spells, their first response will be to retreat, gather military resources and reinforcements, and then return, mobilizing as many soldiers as they can to surround the inn and burn it and whatever devilish witchcraft is going on there to the ground. Another possibility is that the characters could offer to help the refugee Steiners and flee with them before the soldiers arrive. Again, this is a perfectly valid choice. And if they can deliver proof back to Herzog, the owner of the inn, that they successfully got the refugees to the location they're trying to reach, then he will be very grateful and he will give them like free room and board and maybe some like financial inducement and reward as well. If the characters turn in the Steiners, however, you know, I mean, maybe they've got no sympathy for them. Maybe they're acting on behalf of the Imperial Army that's trying to get them. They could just sell them out when the soldiers arrive. If they do that, then only one squad of soldiers turns up to claim the Steiners because they assume that they can rely on the player characters for help. The player characters can then report to the military camp and they'll get a 200 silver piece reward. And in case you're not aware, Lamentations of the Flame Princess uses a silver piece standard. So one silver piece in Lamentations is roughly equivalent to what one gold piece would be in any other sort of version of D&D. And we also get a few other sort of ideas, you know, what to do if the characters attack the Imperial spies, what if they attack the soldiers, what if they just rob the inn, etc. We then get a description of the inn and the old linden tree, a hollow tree that's used as this letter drop outside, and a couple of pages that break down the various different rooms of the inn, what services are available, how much stabling and in-room costs, etc. All the sort of stuff you need to know to run an inn with a degree of verisimilitude in a session. We get some details on the military camp located a short distance away under the auspices of Captain Morgan Khan, a Catholic exile from Wales. And we get stats for him, his sergeant, privates and their camp followers. Then we move on to descriptions of the NPCs and we tend to get sort of two descriptions and stats per page and then on the facing page we get some of these lovely black and white illustrations of the NPCs themselves and I don't know why but I just find this black and white artwork really striking there's something about fairly simple and I don't mean that in a bad way I just mean sort of bold black and white artwork that really speaks to me of the sort of like old school vibe so I love all of this we get stats and details for Griswold Herzog the innkeeper and his wife Jala 
Gabriella Herzog, the stable girl, obviously their daughter, and a short write-up on the younger Herzogs, uh, Otto, age four, Ilsa, age two, and Gretchen, their newborn. Then we get some details on the deserter, Ludwig Steiner, and his family of refugees, Wilhelmina, his wife, and their young children, Waldemar, age eight, Conrad, age five, Dieter, age two, and Alexa, newborn. We get some details and stats for Sergeant Johann Orth and Katerina Rupel, an, an Imperial Intelligencer. Anna Engel, another Imperial spy. Some mercenaries who accompany them. And then we get a nice battle map of the inn to round this all off. This is a hardback book at just over 30 pages in length. And it's put together using the typically excellent standards of construction that I've come to expect from a Lamentations of the Flay Princess releases. It's available on drive through rpg in pdf form only for just under eight dollars us which at the time of recording is about five pounds 90 in british money or if you want to get a hard copy with the pdf included you can purchase it from the lamentations of the flame princess web store where it will cost you 13 euros 20 which at the time of recording is just over 11 pounds in british money or just over 15 dollars us as I said earlier, I think this is a great bridge adventure because although it's set against the backdrop of this terrible civil and religious conflict that's going on, it doesn't delve too much into the details of that. That is just the backdrop. The focus here is squarely on the effect that that conflict has had on the lives of the people involved and this firestorm effectively that the player characters through no fault of their own i mean after all they're just stopping at an inn find themselves in the middle of so it pushes them into this sort of moral crucible where they have to make their own decisions and see what is forged out of the result of their actions. It's a very self-contained little adventure with only really like a couple of locations being involved if you include the military camp. Otherwise, it's mostly sat around the sort of Herzog a small holding with the inn, the tree, etc. And it involves a very small select group of NPCs. So it's really easy for a GM, even if you're a time poor GM, to absorb all the details you need to know about these NPCs and to sort of know what's going on with everyone. All you really need to have open at the table is this timeline. Although what I'd probably do is I'd probably write it down on like index cards and then if I need to change it, I can just like rub things out on the index card and write them in or whatever. But that's just how I do it. It's an interesting look at one potential method of creating an adventure. This laying out of here's a timeline of what happens if the player characters do nothing and here's some advice for how to handle their interactions with the various elements of the plot. Now, some gems will be comfortable with that. I personally really love it. I'm quite capable of sort of flexing the uh, the timeline and going with that, whatever weirdness the player characters suggest. Some gems may be a little bit less comfortable with this, but I think this is a small enough adventure and it's so self-contained that this could be a good first step into gems who want to ease themselves into this style of adventure. I definitely recommend you give it a look. If you're looking for an intriguing sort of moral quandary that you can very easily adapt to your own campaigns and drop in there as a little sort of a side, a little side trek to use the old parlance between the major events of your campaign. Doesn't have the world shaking outcome of many of the other modules we've looked at this week, but as the author says themselves, you don't want everything to be fantastic and world ending. Sometimes you just want a little mundane story where the player characters have some difficult decisions to make. And I think that's true and that this module is probably, for that reason, one of my favourites that I've looked at this week. Anyway, so there's my flip through and what I think of the book. Hopefully you'll give it a look if you're at all interested in it. If you've enjoyed this video, please like it, share the link, review it and do all that other good stuff that people are always asking you to do. Have a great day and I hope whatever games you're playing now and in the future, you have great fun with it. Take care.